I'm going to embarrass Mark. I'm going to give you some information about him to make him embarrassed about his fantastic past in ELT. I've got a number here, Mark, uh, okay. which is preceding the word years in ELT. Do you want me to say that number? Or? That's fine. So oh, it's actually written on the screen anyway. Yeah. Uh, so Mark's been here, uh, been here. He's been here in the ELT community uh, for over 20 years as a teacher, teacher trainer, director of studies, materials writer. And now he's an academic consultant for Macmillan Education. Uh, he's based in, in Mexico. He's got Cert TESOL, DIP TESOL for Trinity. Um, his areas of interest include teaching with minimal resources, blended learning and learner independence. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, Mark is part of the Macmillan fold and he's here today to talk to us about learner independence for teenagers and young adults. I think that's quite enough of my voice, Mark. I'm gonna, right. uh, I'm gonna hand them over to you. Have a great time. Thanks, thanks very much, Will, it's very kind. And thanks for not reading out all of that stuff because I know it can be quite dry you know, when we read out the, the, the bios. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So good morning, uh, everybody from Mexico. Good afternoon and good evening wherever you are uh, in the world. So the topic of learner independence has been very much on the agenda recently uh, as a result of the current situation, the, the COVID-19 situation. Uh, it seems to be a recognition that it's, if we're working in online classes, um, it's difficult to get as much work done as normal in an online class and it's difficult to uh, create the conditions that we need for, for interaction, for communication, for production, the kind of stuff that we typically uh, do in, in a language class. Uh, and so it's kind of a general kind of consensus or general kind of recognition that in order to um, have effective uh, online classes which offer the conditions that we need for language learning uh, we're going to need to plan for synchronous or face-to-face -face sessions uh, and asynchronous sessions where we're going to have to let students uh, get on with work outside of uh, class without our direct supervision right they're going to need to be uh, independent learners so what i want to show you today are yes some practical ideas that you can apply in your classes for uh, developing um, learner independence but i'd also uh, i want to look at some principles uh, behind learner independence so that you can plan your, your learner independence uh, more effectively so that, that students are more willing and more able to, to take part in the kind of tasks that we set up. So that's, that's the plan for today. Okay, and so we're talking a lot about learner independence at the moment because of the current situation. But learner independence uh, is not a new thing, I'm sure that you know, and learner independence has always been important for language learning, right? Students need to amass uh, a large quantity of uh, lexical items to build their vocabulary. Um, they need to uh, listen, read, find opportunities to use language outside of the classroom. And quite often, the number of hours that we have in class are simply not enough to be able to do all the things that we need in order to, to help students learn a language, right? So learner independence, um, you know, a certain degree of learner independence has always been possible, uh, always been necessary. It's not just necessary now because of the current situation, but we're talking about it now because we need to think about it more, uh, given that it's more difficult to have communicative classes in online situations, or if we're in some kind of mixed scenario where we have a few of our students in class and uh, they're coming different days of the week, they're gonna need to engage in communication outside of class, okay? Now, a quick look at the research shows that um, independent learners do the following kinds of things. They self-evaluate, they know when they are uh, engaged in effective learning or, or when they're doing things that are not really working out for them. They organize their learning in such a way that they um, are able to find uh, an appropriate place to study and plan uh, the amount of time required to do certain tasks. Uh, they're good independent learners are able to set goals and the best kind of um, independent learners set more challenging goals, uh, which kind of gets them started with, with engaging in language learning activities. They monitor their 
their progress towards these goals. And they use strategies and techniques in order to um, consciously learn language and practice language, um, rehearse and memorize and, 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 and uh, you know, make, make conscious efforts to, to, to improve their language skills. And when they're having trouble, they're able to speak to their classmates, their friends, their teachers uh, to ask for help, right? However, hello, hello, everybody just joining us. However, just because we give students work to do outside of the live class doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be able to do it, they're going to want to do it, or they're going to have the necessary skills to do it effectively. So, uh, guys, I'm going to ask a quick question in the chat for you. Now, recently, I was reading a book about the science of learning. And I'll give you the, the reference to the book in the bibliography at the end. But one of the chapter names caught my attention. It was a book, it's a book about the science of learning. And one of the units, uh, one of the chapters, sorry, one of the chapters is called Why Independent uh, Learning is Not a Good Way to Become. Now, can you complete that sentence? Can you complete that uh, chapter title for me? Why independent learning is not a good way to become exactly uh, David Brezeño in Mexico. Yeah, why independent learning is not a good way to become an independent learner, right? For all of the reasons that I just mentioned, giving students work to do outside of the class doesn't mean they're necessarily, necessarily going to develop good independent learning skills, right? And so the kind of... Um, focuses on, on, on the talk today, this, this idea, right? We can't just give students work to do. They require teacher support uh, in order to be able to uh, get started with the tasks, monitor, check their learning, and essentially succeed and become good in, independent learners, okay? So this is where my idea of the five keys come from. We have an important role as teachers to help set up independent learning tasks in such a way that students are going to really take advantage of them and, and succeed with them. And so these are my five keys for today's session. The first one is purpose. The second one is structure and strategies. The third one is goal setting. The fourth is reflection. And the fifth is decision making. Okay, so my basic argument today is that when we are planning for asynchronous work and having students work independently outside of our classes, if we take these five keys, which we're going to look at over the next 45 minutes, into consideration, we're, we're more likely to uh, experience success as teachers in our classes and learners are more likely to become better independent learners and succeed with the tasks that we give them. Okay, so that's a plan. Obviously, I'm going to elaborate on these points, but uh, because we're kind of pushed for time, I'm going to elaborate on them as I show you different examples rather than explaining them all now. Okay, and we're going to focus on three general areas in terms of activities. So we're going to focus on out of class reading, deliberate vocabulary learning, and out of class speaking uh, and writing. And that's simply because, in my personal opinion, these are areas that are particularly appropriate for, for independent learning. Okay, so we're going to look at these areas and we're going to talk about the five keys. Okay, so that's the plan. Uh, I hope uh, everybody's still interested after that little introduction. And we have a lot to do. So let's get stuck in. Okay, so the first key is purpose. And this is probably the one that I need to say the least about, and it's the one that we'll probably talk about the least, right? But as language teachers, we should always be able to rationalize or explain why we do certain things in the classroom, right? We should be able to, to explain why we, everything that we do in a lesson, we should be able to say why we're doing it. And the reasons that we give for the different activities that we do in classes will reflect uh, our own beliefs about language teaching and learning, right? And so, for example, if I decide that I'm going to set up a program with Macmillan readers, right? And now you probably know, right? But readers are literature, 
plays, short stories where the language, the plots, uh, the structure of the text has been simplified or adapted to meet the, the needs of learners at specific levels. If I set up a reader program at my school, that probably tells you that in my view, the driving force behind any language acquisition is comprehension of meaningful language, right? And that when students are engaged in meaningful language use, then much of the language learning process happens automatically and spontaneously, right? And so language learning is much more than just studying rules or lists of vocabulary, right? They need opportunities to use language in meaningful ways, right? So the reason why I set up my readers program is because these are my beliefs about language learning. Maybe it also tells you that in my view, um, students need many, many encounters with pieces of language and with vocabulary in order to really learn them, right? I mean, we can learn the form and meaning in class, but we need to have multiple encounters with language outside of class in order to really get an idea for the use of language, right? So that's why I would set up a reader's program. And uh, it's fine that as a teacher, I can uh, express my rationale for, for doing that. But there seems to be a consensus in the literature that it's important too that students understand why we do certain things in the class. Um, and I'm always reminded of um, David Noonan, who was writing in the 1990s, and something that stuck with me uh, throughout my years as a teacher was his research showed that lang for language teachers, when they're surveyed about the most popular uh, activities uh, for them, language teachers always say that pair work is their favorite activity or small group work. But when you survey students about what their favorite language learning activities are, they always say that pair work and small group work is often one of their least favorites, right? And so there's this, it, it, it doesn't match what we think they enjoy and what they enjoy might not always match. And it could be because they don't understand, students don't understand why, we'd, why we do certain things in class. And so uh, it makes sense, especially with teens and with adults, to have conversations about how we learn language and uh, why we do certain things in the class. Now, Carol Reed, the writer, the trainer, um, the, the, the teacher uh, who's written many course books and books for Macmillan, in one of her, her resource books for primary school teachers, she has this fantastically simple suggestion for explaining the purpose of activities. And she simply says that we should convey the purpose using the phrase, in order to. As simple as that, right? So if I tell my students, we're gonna read three news articles a week outside of class, articles from the web. I need to convey that purpose simply with a phrase with in order to. So we're gonna read those three news articles a week in order to improve your grammar right, or in order to deepen your word knowledge, or in order to build your confidence uh, in reading uh, authentic texts, right, and so we have this conversation so they understand why we're doing certain things in class. So as underwhelming as that might sound, that's the first step, okay, so uh, key one, conveying the purpose to our students in simple language so that they understand why we do the things that we do in class. Similarly, if I tell my students that we're going to use flashcards and I want you to learn 20 words a week, they need to know why, right? And so maybe my target for the end of the course uh, or the end of the first year of study is that they'll know 500 word families, okay? So in order for you to learn those 500 words by the end of the year, we're going to study those 20 words a week, okay? So that's, that's key number one, okay? Purpose, all right? So, good. Key number two is structure and strategies. Now, research tells us that students are more likely to engage in a language, act, a language learning activity if they feel that they are able to succeed, okay? This uh, is what psychologists call self-efficacy. The idea of self-efficacy is that I'm more motivated to do things that I can do than to do things uh, that I can't do, right? And I'm sure we all feel that way, 
right? And so this implies that when we are setting asynchronous work for our students to do outside of the classroom, we need to set it up uh, or structure it in such a way that our students uh, understand the strategies or the steps or the processes that they're going to go through in order to successfully complete the task. In short, they need to be able to see themselves doing the task, right? So if we can help them build this sense of confidence in their own abilities to be able to do the work that we're asking them to do, they're more likely to be motivated to do it and they're more likely to do it, okay? And this is the idea of self-efficacy. Right, and so I'm going to show you uh, three different examples here. The first one's really simple, right? So don't don't stress out if you think this is too obvious. We'll look at some slightly more interesting ones. Scaffolding is the key. Someone saying in the chat yet? So here is a sequence from a course book. Now I know it's a little bit small. My goal here is not really for you to read it. Uh, we're going to do some reading later. But this one, I can just tell you that this is a writing task in which the students are going to write an article about two things that they like about their home, okay? So they need to write an article about two things that they like about their home. But in order to get them there, the first step in preparation is for them to look at a list of possible things to talk about and choose two items from the list. So they could talk about their bedroom or they could talk about their garden, uh, or, or something else about their home, and then to uh, brainstorm, write down a couple of um, reasons why they want to talk about those two things. Okay, so that's the first step in moving towards this writing task. And then the second step, the students are given a table uh, which uh, describes the purpose of each paragraph and gives some useful language that they could use in each paragraph. And then they're uh, asked to add their own information in the My Notes section. So before asking the students to engage in this asynchronous writing task, possibly uh, at home, um, before our next class, in class, we can go through this procedure carefully working towards this, this kind of final target task. But like scaffolding, as you're telling me in the chat box, I was trying not to use too much jargon today, but yes, exactly that, right? Scaffolding. So this is one really simple example of how we can prepare students for success um, by making sure they understand exactly what they've got to do and providing structure to a task, right? Rather than just saying, I want you to write this article at home. I know none of you probably do that, right? But this is a very lovely example from a course book of how we can structure a writing task, okay? So, Yes, too much jargon is bad. I agree in the chat. Perfect. Now, second example here. Right, now, so I talked about the importance of reading and I mentioned the, the readers earlier. I'm not, I'm not trying to sell these, I'm just uh, using them as an example. Um, so maybe your school is a fantastic school and you have invested in readers and you have a reader program uh, where students are going to uh, read two or three or four graded readers every semester. And that's amazing. Good for you. I'm jealous, right? That's absolutely fantastic. For most of us, and particularly those of us that work in adult language teaching, any independent reading that we ask our students to do is likely to be web-based, right? We're likely to ask our students to go online. Maybe we help them find uh, sources of articles. Uh, and we will have the students uh, read two, three uh, articles from the internet, okay? Now, that may be fine for some students, but we might wish to structure the task in such a way so that students know exactly what they have to do. We don't want to get to the end of the first week and discover that our students didn't do the task because they weren't really sure what they had to do. Now, one way that we can do this, and one really efficient way that we can do this is through what are called reading procedures, right? And reading procedures are steps or lesson or pedagogical sequences. There we go again with jargon. Sequences of activities which can be applied to any reading text, okay? And I am going to demonstrate, and you guys are going to do it with me now, 
a reading procedure, okay? So I just wanna check that I've got everybody's attention. We're gonna work together now on a reading procedure. Okay, everybody ready? Okay, so a reading pro procedure is a sequence that we can apply to any reading text and it's gonna reduce your lesson planning time. Okay, now, so everybody's saying yes. So 600 people saying yes. Okay, brilliant. So first stage in this procedure is to skim a text. Now, I imagine most of you are language teachers. When we tell our students to skim a text, what do they actually have to do? What does skimming involve? What does skimming a text actually involve? Tell me, for general understanding, yes, get basic info. Headings, okay, this is what I'm interested in. Somebody said reading the headings. Keywords, okay, so when, okay, it's difficult to really interact uh, on the, like this on a chat box, but let me give you my view. When I, when I tell my students to skim the text, and I know there are different ways of doing this, I tell them to just read the content words. Quickly run your eyes over the content words. Content words are nouns, main verbs, adjectives, lexical words, right? Words with meaning, skip the grammar words, just cast your eyes over those lexical words, okay? And so we are gonna do this now. I'm gonna show you a text and I want you to skim the text, all right? There's gonna be four pages and I'm only gonna give you 20 seconds, and I'm looking at my phone to set my stopwatch now. I'm only gonna give you 20 seconds to look at each page, okay? So you're gonna skim the text however you wanna skim it. I would suggest just look at the content words for 20 seconds. Then I'm gonna change the page and you've got another 20 seconds, okay? Yes, teacher, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. So page one is coming now. Skim the text, guys, skim the text. 20 seconds to skim this text. Okay, that's your first 20 seconds. Next page, skim the next page, please. Okie dokie, 20 seconds for the next page. OMG in the text box. Don't focus on the text box, focus on the reading. Just skim, just skim, just skim, just skim the text, skim the text. I didn't set you a task yet. Okay, final page, only 10 seconds for the final page because it's short, 10 seconds. Oh yeah, 10 seconds is up now. Okay, brilliant guys, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Okay, so everybody skim the text, hopefully. And you should have seen, uh, some of you recognize the author. Uh, it's from Scott Thornbury and it talks about different ways of working uh, with reading texts in class. Okay, so you skim the text once. This is the first step. Now, I'm gonna give you the opportunity to read the text more carefully, but before that, before we read the text again, I imagine that it was too difficult to get your head around everything in the text and you have some questions uh, that you'd like to answer by the text or some points that you would look at again in the text. Yes or no? Tell me in the chat box. Are there things that you would like to look at again in the text? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, can you, what, what questions would you like answered by the text? Can you give me some examples of specific questions that you'd like the text to answer? reading actions, discourse knowledge. What are you looking for? Now, now that you have a rough idea of the text, what do you wanna know? More details on strategies, extensive versus intensive reading, the way to use it. Brilliant, right? Okay, so we're gonna go into the next step of our procedure. The first step was to skim the text. And the second step in this procedure was to raise some questions about exactly the kinds of things that you're telling me in the chat. I'm now gonna give you the opportunity to read the text again, and I'm gonna show each page for one minute, 
okay? As you read, I want you to uh, think about your own questions and talk to yourselves in your mind. I don't want to get too humanistic here, but in the same way that we do when we read in, in real life for, for normal purposes, have a little conversation with yourself in your mind as it answers your questions. What's interesting, what surprises you, you know, and in, um, t this is called text talk. As you read, talk to yourself, answer your questions. You ready, everybody? Does that make sense? We're going to read it again, and you're going to answer your own questions in your minds. One minute on each page. Starts now. Here we go. Okay, everybody's say, telling me they make sense. So you've got a minute to read this page now. Try and answer your questions. Block out my annoying voice. Focus on the text. Read, 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 guys. Answer your own questions. Check the information. Thank you, Ugo. That's very kind of you. Keep reading, guys. Keep reading, keep reading, keep reading. Keep reading. My voice is good. Thank you. People are so lovely, aren't they? Okie dokie. Now, that's been a minute, so we're going to go to the next page. Okay, so read the next page. You've got a minute. As you read, talk to yourself in your mind, text talk, answer your own questions. Dr. Amita, I'm sorry, uh, but we will share the presentation. We will share the video. You can buy Scott's book. Okay, Elena, I'll keep my mouth shut. I just don't want people to turn off their computers, you know? Thirty seconds. <laughs> Don't ignore the chat, guys. Don't ignore her. Ignore me. Ignore the chat. Keep reading. Let's be nice in the chat, guys. Life's too short. Yeah, I'll share the name of the books at the end. Don't worry, I've got a decent reading list for you at the end. You'll have tons of homework after this session. Next minute starts now. One minute. One minute. I'm 10 people short of my all-time webinar record of 633. Come on, keep going up, number. Come on. I'm not going to do it today, are we? No one will turn off their computer. That's lovely to hear. Thank you. Keep reading, guys. Look for useful information. Answer your own questions. Talk to yourselves in your mind. Talk to yourselves in your mind. It's okay to talk to yourself when you're reading. Nobody's going to think bad of you. Okie dokie. And the final page, you just get 30 seconds for the final page because it's short. It's not the TKT book. It's uh, Thornbury's uh, new A to Z of ELT. But I'll give you the details at the end. Stick around, right? That's your incentive, right? Stick around and I'll, I'll give you the details. Okie dokie. So you can stop reading there, guys. Stop, stop reading there. And so um, we scanned the text, but we didn't have enough time to read it carefully. So we thought about some questions or some points that we'd like it to elaborate on or, or answer. Then we have more time to read it again. And as we read it again, we engage in text talk and answer our questions to ourselves. And the final stage of this procedure is, is simply to reflect on and make notes on what I've learned. right? And this could easily be turned into a kind of a task for the teacher. So the students do the reading on their own, and then they make some notes at the end, reflect on the text. And what we just did um, is, called, is an example of a reading procedure. Now, this particular procedure is called SQ3R. 
okay? And this comes from Christine Nuttall's uh, book on teaching reading skills, which is an ELT classic. She sadly passed away this year, but it's a very, very good book for teaching reading. Uh, Nuttall's book came out in, I think, 1981 originally, so it's not a new technique, and she actually cites it back to 1964. So, I mean, this is a classic uh, technique for, that works with any text. So, the first stage is to survey the text, SQ3R, S stands for survey, and this is basically skimming the text to decide if it's useful uh, and if I want to keep reading it or if, I, if, if it's going to provide me with useful information. That's the first stage. The second stage is to stop and to think specifically about what questions or which points I would like the text to answer. And in terms of language teaching, we can ask students to write these questions down. So depending on the length of the text, they can write down two, three, four, five questions. They then read the text again to answer their own questions. And as they do so, that's obviously the read stage. And as they read again, or oh, I accidentally changed the page, but as they read again, uh, they engage in what Nuttall calls recite, which is basically to engage in kind of text talk and internal conversation as you answer the questions about the text to yourself. And then at the end, you reflect on, you write down what you've learned from this text, okay? And so the idea of this procedure is that it can be used with any text. I mean, if you haven't planned your lesson because you know you had a busy weekend doing whatever you get up to at the weekends, you can come to class on Monday morning and you can just do SQ3R with very, very little preparation. But the idea would be that we demonstrate this a few times in class so students understand the process. And then we can ask them to do it themselves for independent reading outside of the class, okay? So, that's one example of a reading procedure. Now, if you're thinking that uh, SQ3R is not exactly your cup of tea, then if you Google reading procedures and ESL or, or language learning, you're going to see many, many different examples. And in fact, good, good ELT books on, on reading will have examples of reading procedures. Here's a, a really simple one. I mean, you could create your own based on your own views about learning. I see some questions in the, in the chat box about how we should teach learning. Um, I don't want to get engaged too much in a discussion about right and wrong, but I mean, surely a good reading activity prepares students to read every text, not just today's text. And so students will always need to get the gist and they'll always need to get the details and they'll always need to be able to identify uh, the tone or the attitude, right, of the author. And so an additional reading procedure, and one that I've used with language learners and um, on teacher training courses, is simply to have the students write the following headings on their sheet of paper or on, in their notebooks, which is gist, purpose, organization, specific details, writer's attitude, and source. Write each heading in your notebook, leave enough space to, me to make notes, read the text, make notes under each heading. Now, in class, that can be turned into a wonderfully collaborative activity. Uh, how we do it in a face-to-face -face session is that the students re read the text individually first and they make notes. We then take the text back from the, te from the students uh, and organize them into groups of three and they compare their notes under each of the headings. Now, usually and hopefully, the students realize that they would like to read the text again to elaborate on their notes. So they compare their notes, they copy each other, they share their notes with each other. Hopefully there's some gaps in their knowledge. So what we do to make it collaborative is we give one of the three the text back and we tell that person that they are responsible for finding the information that the group needs and then reporting back to the to the other members of the group. And so we get a lovely collaborative uh, reading activity. And again, if we can model this in class, and get their students used to this idea of looking for gist, looking for details, looking for attitude, then they can do it with um, any text, okay? So that's just another example of, um, of a reading procedure. Uh, there's a couple of questions in the text. We'll, uh, we're gonna see those at the end, right, the questions. So don't worry, we'll deal with those at the end, okay? So that was another example of giving a task structure, not just go home and read three texts, but making sure students understand what they can do with a text and kind of structuring the reading in such a way that they, they, they can see themselves doing it, okay? 
Now, there's one more example of giving structure, okay? So, um, we were talking earlier about vocabulary, and researchers, experts um, estimate that if students can build a working vocabulary of 3,000 word families, then they will be able to understand approximately 95% of spoken interaction, right? So if we get up to 3,000 words, we can understand 95% of speech, general kind of English speech. And um, it's estimated that learning 800 words per year in English class is possible to work towards this bigger target if we have an organized vocabulary uh, learning strategy at the school. And the most effective way for students to learn the basic form and meaning of a word is through flashcards, right? Yeah, whether it's, you know, flashcards on card or whether it's flashcards on an app on your phone, and I'll give you a suggestion for a good app at the end of the session. Using flashcards is a really, really effective way to um, learn vocabulary. The numbers that I just mentioned uh, in the chat, sorry, 3,000 words to understand 95%, that's according to Paul Nation, okay? So that should be our goal, right? So we need to learn vocabulary, and the most effective way of doing it is using either physical or flashcard apps on the phone. The reason why flashcards work, guys, the reason why flashcards work is because they involve retrieval, right? Retrieval practice. Now, retrieval means bringing information to mind. Retrieval means taking information from your long-term memory and bringing it into your working memory to do something with it, okay? And scientists believe that memory is strengthened for retrieved information when students engage in retrieval practice, when they engage in taking it from their long-term memory and bringing it into their working memory, okay? So this is why flashcards work. Now, if your students just have their vocabulary written in a list in their notebooks and they have the English word and the translation and they review the, the list, that doesn't involve retrieval. That just involves decoding. But the, the reason why flashcards work is because we have the word on one side, the translation on the other, and when I see the word without looking at the translation, I try to retrieve it, right? And that's what strengthens the memory connections. Right, so that's why flashcards or flashcard apps work. So the basic procedure is that I have a new Spanish word for me, in my case, reventar, on one side, and on the other side, I have my translation, okay? And I have what? At any one time, I'm gonna have, I don't know, between 10 and 30 words in my flashcard pile, and I'm gonna go through my list, and I'm gonna see my new word, and I'm gonna try and retrieve the translation, right? Now, if I successfully retrieve the translation, I'm going to put the card to one side and I'm going to keep going through the pile. If I'm unable to retrieve the translation, then the word goes to the bottom of the pile and it comes back later in my retrieval session, right? So that's basically how flashcards work, right? Now, once I have successfully learned those translations, then I just switch it round and then I do the same procedure again with the translations and I try to retrieve the target word. And that's obviously more difficult, right? But probably more useful for productive language use, okay? So retrieval practice enables us to learn tons of vocabulary and it's the most effective way to do it. But again, we need to structure this in class so students understand exactly how to do it. So in class or in a, in a, in a virtual class or in a face-to-face -face class, we can demonstrate retrieval through really simple flashcard games, right? So I'm gonna demonstrate one to you now. Uh, I'm gonna be student A and all 649, yes, my new record, 649 of you are student B, okay? And the objective in each round of the game is, well, one person starts with the cards, that's me, and in, then you have to win the cards from me by retrieving the words, okay? And we're gonna play in three rounds, okay? So here we go, round one. In round one, 
I am going to show you and say the target word. Then I'm going to show you the translation. I'm going to show you the target word again, and you need to retrieve the translation. Okay, you ready? And you can tell me in the chat box. Ready? Okay. So, don't laugh at my Spanish, those of you in Mexico and Peru. Okay? Reventar. Burst. Okay? Now, look, follow, follow my instructions, guys. Not because I like to be in control, because I do, but because this is the procedure for retrieval. So, reventar, burst. I show you the card again. Now you tell me the translation. Burst, burst, burst. Okay, so now you'll retrieve the word. Okay, next. Okay. De un tirón. In one go. De un tirón. Now retrieve it and tell me in the chat. In one go, in one go, yeah. Okay, so you would keep the card, okay? So every time you retrieve the word successfully, you keep the card. Next one. Elenco. It's cast of a movie, cast of a play, okay? Elenco, retrieve the word, retrieve the word. Cast, 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 okay? One more, one more Spanish word for you, or one more Spanish lexical item for you. Okay. Aplazamiento. Okay, so you say it, or you... Okay, I show you the translation. Delay. I show you aplazamiento again, and you tell me. Delay. Okay, so that's round one. And if you've successfully retrieved the words and told me the words, you keep all the cards, and then we repeat, repeat the procedure, but now you elicit the items from me and I, re I retrieve the items, okay? That's round one, okay? Now, I've got all of the cards back because I'm an amazing Spanish learner and I won all of the cards back. And we're gonna go back to the beginning of the pile and we're gonna play round two, okay? So now in round two, I'm just gonna show you the card and I want you to retrieve the translation. You ready? So, reventar, tell me in the chat box, burst. Burst, 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 burst. Okay? Okay. Next. De un tirón. In one go, in one go. Yeah, okay. Brilliant. Next. Elenco. Retrieve. Retrieve the word. Elenco. All right, good. You keep the cards. You keep the cards. Final one, aplazamiento. Uh, you're too quick, guys. You're supposed to be retrieving the words based on the, on the prompt, okay? So that would be round two, yeah? So I just show you the card, and you uh, retrieve the word. If you're successful, you keep the card. If you're not successful, it goes to the back of the pile, okay? And then you do the same for me, and I try to retrieve the words. And then in round three, I'm not gonna show you the cards, I'm just going to tell you the, the word, and you have to retrieve the word. Okay, so, reventar. Brilliant, okay. De un tirón. Brilliant. So you keep the cards, you keep the cards. Elenco. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Aplazamiento. Perfect, okay? So hopefully you saw there that those were the three stages of the flashcard game, right? So show and say, elicit, and then the person wins the card, and then simply just show, and then simply just say. We can demonstrate that, we can play that in, the, in class, and then students understand the concept of, of retrieval, right? So that would be one way to structure retrieval practice in class using a flashcard game like that, and then students can go home and study the cards themselves, okay? All right. So, yeah, there's our cards again. Let's just jump through there. Okay, now, the third um, key that 
I want to mention today is goal setting. So our first key was purpose, the second was structures and strategies, and the third is goal setting. Um, and so there seems to be a correlation in research, in the literature, um, between goal setting and um, academic or educational success, right? So students who set goals um, are better learners, better independent learners. Now, if we, uh, all lived in a perfect world and we had highly motivated adult ESL learners and we said to them why are you studying English and as they often tell me I need English for my work and then we can say well what exactly do you need to do in your work in English and they say I need to understand emails from my boss or I need to understand technical manuals because we build airplanes just around the corner and we don't want them to fall out of the sky uh, and and so we basically Students are really motivated, they know their goals, and we can take those um, goals and we can turn them into action plans, right? And so we can set, you know, weekly goals, monthly goals, semester goals, whatever they are. So here's my goal, here's your action plan. So I need to understand emails from my boss, so I'm gonna memorize 10 email expressions using this amazing flashcard technique that Mark just showed me. Uh, or I'm gonna do three extra reading activities a week. But if you're working in, um, secondary school, high school, and your students are what is sometimes amusingly called tenor students or teaching English for no obvious reasons. It might be more difficult for them to, um, to, to articulate their specific goals, right? So in a perfect world, we would get something like this, where students say, oh, my goal is to score B on the next English test, and that would be great. So how can I help you with that? Let's establish some action plans, and they're going to review their English notes after every class at the weekends, or they're going to watch a, a series in English with subtitles to consolidate their English, right? That would be great. But most of you that work in secondary and, and high school might tell me that it's not that simple, and students will struggle to be able to articulate their goals in that way. Uh, and so we might need to add more structure to this procedure. This is a really lovely example from uh, the teachingenglish.org website, which is the BBC and British Council's uh, language learning website. They have this really simple, really lovely goal setting lesson plan um, in which essentially uh, in order to help students um, kind of see or, or make more tangible learning goals. They engage in a reading sequence, uh, first of all. Um, and the text that the students read are essentially a list of goals written by another fictional student. So here in the square in the middle, we have um, every day I'm going to record myself describing the weather outdoors. Or every week I'm going to write a recipe for a dish that I like. Or every month I'm going to watch a cooking video in English, right? And so the idea is, that in order to raise students' awareness of, of goals and, and action plans, the first step is that they essentially read this text and answer two stages of um, comprehension questions. So the first questions are, what skills are being developed and do you think it will be easy or difficult? And the second one is, which hobbies does the person seem to have? Right. So it's essentially a reading activity, but the purpose of reading is to raise awareness of language learning goals. So this will be done in class. And then the second step having comprehended the text, right, read the text, comprehended the text, the students then use it as a model to write their own language learning goals. And I think that's a really lovely, simple example of how we can get secondary school students to, to set their goals, right? So uh, check that out on the teachingenglish.org.uk website if you are interested in that, okay? Okie dokie. So, that was our third goal. That was our third key, goal setting. Fourth key is reflection, okay? And by reflection, I'm thinking of monitoring learning, having set goals, and uh, self-assessment. Now, if you talk to parents or school managers or even students about self-assessment, they might misunderstand the purpose or the goal of self-assessment, right? They might think, oh my God, you want the students to decide if they're gonna pass the course, right? You want the students to give themselves an A grade, right? That's obviously not the purpose of self-assessment, right? So all of the stakeholders involved need to understand that self-assessment is really about helping students become better 
language learners. Now you should remember the writing activity that I showed you at the start of the session where students were gonna write uh, an article about two things that they like about their homes. And they were given a careful uh, structure or scaffolding, as you were telling me in the chat, to, to do the task. Now, a, an additional step in this lesson is a self-assessment checklist that the students fill in before they hand in the work. And so it asks them to reflect critically on their work here. I've started my article in an interesting way. I've used an appropriate style. I've written the right number of words, so on and so forth. So this is an example of, of a, a, a direct self-assessment where before students submit the work, they fill in this checklist to make sure that it meets the requirements. And I mean, you can create these yourselves for any piece of work that you set. Right, And so uh, we can use very simple direct assessments like that. Another way is to use checklists which are indirect. And this just means that they are about more general language learning behaviors, right? So this one is not related to a specific task. It says, I can evaluate my own language competencies. I can analyze my own needs. I can set myself goals and the students score themselves on a scale. Right, so it's another example of, of self-assessment, okay? This enables students to take some responsibility uh, over their learning process, right? Now, an even, an even more simple way comes from Dylan Williams' fantastic book on um, formative assessment. Uh, and I've seen other uh, books copy this idea. Uh, basically, Dylan William proposes a learning log that students do at the end of every lesson, where they're given a number of different sentence frames and you could change these or add your own examples as you see fit. Uh, but the basic idea is that at the end of every lesson, students have to complete two of these sentence frames. So today I learned or I was surprised by, right? And so then they start reflecting on their own learning procedure. And what I like particularly about Dylan Williams' list is that not all of them are positive, right? So it can be useful to draw students' attention to um, the negative aspects of, of their learning processes. So one of the examples here is I might have got more, I might have gotten more from this lesson, you know, if I'd paid attention for 45 minutes or whatever it is, right? So students reflect on their learning processes by simply completing these sentences. So that's a really easy way of introducing self-assessment. Okay. And another classic technique. Uh, is self-transcription. Now, this is slightly different to assessing yourself in terms of your performance, but it's a really useful way to, pr to promote noticing and get students to um, pay attention to their, their weaknesses. And so, you know, you've probably seen this idea before, but let's imagine that we give students a speaking task to do. So let's imagine that I ask one of my students to um, talk uh, about things that they would pack to go on vacation. Now, this is a classic example of an activity that we could do asynchronously because we don't have enough time for productive language use in online classes. So we can use a tool like Padlet um, or we simply Google Classroom and have students record themselves doing productive activities. And that's great. But as a, a, an added step to promote uh, self-evaluation, we can have students engage in transcription. So they do a recording of themselves doing a, a productive task. They listen back and they transcribe, right? And this draws their attention to grammatical mistakes or lexical mistakes or issues of intonation or tonic syllables or word stress that they might not notice when they're engaged in communication in real time. I was gonna play the recording, but we don't really have time and it's not, not really that valuable. But the basic idea here, I mean, this is a very strong student, but he makes some really interesting mistakes. Like he, does, he doesn't put the S on the word clothes, for example. So rather than me just telling him that, the student's attention is going to be drawn to that mistake by listening to himself and maybe he'll be more likely to notice it and do something about it, right? So self-transcription is a really simple way of engaging students in self-evaluation, okay? So self-assessment and monitoring in, uh, as part of reflection is key number four, okay, that we're looking at today. Key number five is connected to this. Key number five is decision-making. And the literature on motivation tells us 
that students are more likely to be motivated if they have ownership over their learning processes. That is, uh, if they're able to make decisions about the content or the procedures, for example, of, of language learning activities or other uh, parts of the language learning process. Now, Linda Murphy, who is famous, or she's known for her work at the Open University in the UK, Open University is a very prestigious distance um, degree course provider and other course types in the United Kingdom. Linda Murphy um, describes uh, in a recent Macmillan book how they set up uh, a strategy at the Open University for language learners to take autonomy or, or become more autonomous in assessment pr procedures at the school. And I think it's something that we could really simply apply at pretty much any school. So in this process, every time that students have to submit a piece of work to be assigned to be graded by the course tutors, there's a two step assessment procedure, self assessment procedure that they have to go through. The first step, the students submit with the work that they are handing in. And they have to, I've taken the questions from Linda Murphy's document here, um, but it says the skills that I've chosen to work on in this assignment, the things I've done well, the things I had difficulty with, any, any other comments, right? So the students do a piece of work and they fill in this self-assessment, right? So far, so good. We've, all, we've already mentioned this kind of thing. But Linda Murphy and her colleagues at the Open University take this to another level. So the student hands in the piece of work with self-assessment part one. The tutor then grades the work and gives qualitative, qualitative feedback in written form. And then the students get their work back and they have to complete part two of the self-assessment, which is where they read and they reflect on their feedback. Uh, and it asks them to um, write a summary of the strengths and weaknesses or the good points and the bad points of the piece of work. And then based on their perceived strengths and weaknesses, students are then asked to identify skills that they wish to improve for their next assignment, right? And asked to come up with an action plan of how they're gonna do it. Now, in order to facilitate this process, the students receive first a tips sheet, which helps them process the feedback from their tutor and tells them not to focus on kind of the emotional element of being criticized, but focus on the key language learning points. And they get a skills sheet, which gives them tips on how they can improve their grammar or how they can improve their reading or listening or speaking skills or whatever. So, and so using the skills sheet, students then come up with an action plan for their next assignment. And so we have this cycle where every time the students submit a piece of work, there's a first self-assessment which reflects on their previous work and shows how it affects the current assignment. And then they get their feedback and that feeds into the next assignment, right? And so what the students identify in part two here, if this makes sense, becomes the content of part one of the next self-assessment. But what do you notice about this? All of the decisions about what I'm going to focus on for this specific development area comes from the student in collaboration with the teacher. So the students are becoming or taking ownership of their language learning process in this way. Okay. Um, so that's one way uh, to incorporate decision making into self-assessment. Um, another way is, I mean, obviously, uh, I don't probably don't need to tell you this, but including a degree of choice in language learning activities. We have to be careful with this because we need to find a balance between the, the right amount of choice and too much choice. And there's research that shows that students that are given complete freedom of choice over a topic. There's, there's one particular research where students had to prepare a, a, a presentation on a famous Russian. Uh, and the students that were given complete free choice over the choice of Russian spent so long agonizing over which Russian to choose that they didn't have enough time to do the task. And they reported, they self-reported as having low levels of motivation for the activity. So we need to find a balance between completely free choice and a kind of 
limited amount of choice that the students can manage. This is a classic example from a course book. The students have to write an article, uh, a, a review, sorry, not an article. They have to write a review for a product that they've bought and they're encouraged to use one of the three items shown on the screen. So you have some choice, but not too much choice because too much choice can be overwhelming or too cognitively demanding, right? And the a final element of choice that is really important because of all the time that we spent talking about retrieval and flashcards is about vocabulary. And we need to help students make choice, make prudent choices about the words that they should study. Now, if you've ever seen Macmillan's online dictionary, you will know that it has red words and a star rating for words. And so there are three star words, two star words, and one star word. Three stars basically means that the word is in the top 2,500 words in terms of frequency. So those would be the words that our students should focus on to, to build that initial 3,000 word vocabulary to be able to understand 95% of, of spoken language. So when students see a text and they think, oh no, there's words I don't know in this text, then if we can show them how to use a Macmillan dictionary, it will be the three star words that they should focus on. Now, maybe you're saying, look, my students are beginners. They're nowhere near top 2,500 words. There are plenty of other tools that we can use for this. This is an example from the website um, English Corpus or the English Corpus website, and I'll give you the full link at the end. This used to be called the Bing Bingham Young uh, Corpus, and it's where you can find the, the Corpus of Contemporary American English. It has this amazing text analysis tool where you can copy any paragraph or any piece of text. You can put it into the system and it will give you a breakdown of the word frequency. So this paragraph here, the turquoise words are in the top 500. The green words are in the top 3,000. So those would be the words that we want to focus on. And obviously, at a beginner level, the top 500 words would be our priorities, right? So we can use this free tool to help students make prudent decisions about what vocabulary to study, OK? So I'll give you the link in a minute. These were the five keys to developing learner independence. Um, I've tried to show you that just giving students work to do asynchronously will not necessarily result in good independent learning, that we need to set up and plan independent learning in such a way that incorporates some of the ideas that I've talked about today, okay? So that brings me to the end of the talk. Here are the links and the reading list. And if there are any questions, I hope we have time to answer a couple of them. So I'll go back to Will, if that's OK. Hello. All right. Well, I don't appear can to see, see Will. Can you so, hear me, Mark? Yeah, here he comes. All right. Sorry, Will. Sorry for being impatient. That's all right, mate. Can you hear me? Hello. All right, good. You got screenshots of the reading list. Good. Uh, the the flashcard app, the flashcard app is Anki, right? So if you want to use a flashcard app, uh, which uh, to learn vocabulary is the one that I would suggest is called Anki. If you can still see me, um, I was just going to show you Anki quickly on my phone. So, and there is a there's a desktop version as well. Uh, Will is there? Just quickly, Will, just give me a second. So sure. this is this is the Anki Joyed app. I have a, a, a an English word, and then I have a, a Spanish translation on the other side. So in Spanish, to say quid pro quo, we say Tina y Daca. And then at the bottom, it it has elements of spaced repetition. So if I don't know the word, I can have it come back in one minute, and I can see it again. And then it will come back in ten minutes. Then it will come back in one day three days, a week, whatever you set it at, right? So we have elements of spaced repetition. That's that's Anki, and that's a flashcard app for learning vocabulary. Okay, Will's here, so over to you. Oh, thanks, Mark. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. Oh, mate, that, Mark, that was just absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. <laughs>